While the holidaymakers slept, the IRA went into action. Six incendiary bombs went off in four town centre shops between 3 and 4.30 in the early hours. The chain store Maples was the worst hit after a bomb went off in the basement. Thousands of pounds worth of damage has been inflicted to all the stores affected. An explosive device also detonated near the popular town pier. As the police operation swung into action, the town center was sealed off for several hours and chaos reigned in the resort. Bournemouth, let alone Dorset, had never had any form of terrorist attacks. However, on the 13th of August 1993, Bournemouth experienced an attack that had the potential of being one of the worst terror attacks in the UK's history. It was early morning when Bournemouth could see incendiary devices going off in these three locations. In the three locations, these four shops were damaged as a result of six incendiary devices. Maples & Co experienced the worst damage in that day. At the time, it was a very upmarket furniture store that found itself becoming a target due to its flammable nature. Two devices in this store were planted, one of which ignited the shop in flames. My name is Kim Simmons and I've lived in Bournemouth for over 50 years. The big fire at Maples, that's the one I really remember because I remember going past that and seeing all the smoke damage. It was just chilling to see the devastation of the fire and that could have so easily been a lot worse than it was. And the smell. The smell was horrible as well. I remember that quite vividly. Typically, the IRA used improvised devices that were made in cigarette boxes. Shopkeepers of the time were often trained to look for these devices. A lot of the devices that were found in Bournemouth, when it did, they did go off, they were incendiary devices. We were actually taught to go in and pat down because the incendiary devices were very th small and thin and they would put them into suit pockets or jacket pockets and we were taught to go in and pat down like this. Then if we found something, then the experts would come in. But that wouldn't happen nowadays. Maples & Co is now a derelict building after the company liquidated four years after the fire, leaving a stark reminder of the attack's effect on Bournemouth. The IRA also used explosives during this attack. These devices were planted on the pier, a historic symbol of Bournemouth. One was located on the west side of the pier and the other underneath the pier theatre. The one under the theatre was reported to be a 20 pound explosive, more than enough to destroy anything in its wake. This explosive was found and rendered safe the next day. During the night before, the pier would host a play called Don't Dress for Dinner with over 800 in attendance. Neither the cast nor audience knew that they were seated directly on top of an explosive device that had the potential to cause mass loss of human life. And I didn't really ever understand that there was such a big bomb underneath the pier. That's quite scary because I've been to that theatre. I used to go to that theatre a lot but I don't recall reading that or hearing about it at the time. The event itself, although not claiming any lives, damaged Bournemouth's tourism for weeks. Shows flopped, the high street fell silent, and it cost traders millions in revenue. The Conservative Conference would be held a year later in the Bournemouth International Centre. Due to the fear of another attack, security would be on high alert. All the impact was all for the build-up to the party political broadcast at the BIC that came um, later, which because of those earlier bombs, the Bournemouth town centre then became quite apocalyptic and no one went to the town centre. All the car parts were closed, shops were closed, there was a helicopter hovering around all the time. We had snipers on the roof at Debenhams and another building opposite the BIC which isn't there anymore. That was very scary. I walked along the beach and that was as close as I got. Everything else we saw on the news, on telly. But that was very chilling to see. People of Irish extraction have numerous stories of being stopped and searched by police throughout the week when the Conservative Party was in town. My name is Martin Bedford. 
I live locally, born and raised in the town in Bournemouth. I'm half, actually half Scots and half Irish, but I always consider myself more Irish because growing up, my mum, I, my grandparents lived with me. My mother, my grandfather were from Cork. My uh, grandmother was from, from Kilkenny. Great grandmother from Limerick, um, all of whom were in Bournemouth. The Conservative Conference was due to meet in Bournemouth at the Bournemouth International Centre, known, known as the BIC. We had one afternoon when the CID paid a visit uh, to the officers and they asked to speak to the general manager. He was an area manager but based in Bournemouth. And they said, look, we need somebody to set up a counter at the International Centre, give them registered envelopes, tell them when the collections are being done, really just smile at them and keep them happy. So we said, oh yeah, yes, we've got a... Um, a gentleman who does all that. We've got a chap called Bedford. Well, they were back the very next day and they said to my boss, actually, he can't come in to the centre. We don't want him in the centre at all. In fact, we don't want him anywhere near the Bournemouth International Centre during the conference. They said, oh, no, 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 we're not. We know all about his political involvement. We know everything he's ever been in and we couldn't be less interested. He's too Irish to allow near the building. So he told me that straight away, and we, la we laughed about it, but during the conference, I was stopped and searched twice, including my car. My daughters, who were very young, at, still at school, were taken out of the car, and me, while they searched the car. And I was stopped one more time prior, prior to the end of the conference. So, um, yeah, I was, you know, I was uh, subjected to quite a lot of keen scrutiny, I must say. It was the big cities. It was London, it was Birmingham. Um, but when they started hitting the seaside towns, that was different, that was new. That's when you start to think, where next? What are they gonna do next? But I think everything changed, or we believed it to have changed after the um, Good Friday Agreement, and that made a massive difference to everybody's lives, I think. In fact, that's one of the things I think as a political achievement we can be really proud of. I am worried about what will happen next. I'm worried about what will happen in the six counties when eventually they will start making plans to, for reunification, um, which is great as far as I'm concerned, but it won't be seen as great to the uh, hardcore loyalists um, who may rekindle their, their anger. And that'll be a problem, I think, probably more for our kin in the South than for, for us here. Uh, so the future's not necessarily safe, but fingers crossed.